uh, you know, I went through a period of about two and a half to three years where I could not pray. I call it a prayer block. You know, you have writer's block at a prayer block. I could not get past their Heavenly Father and Most Righteous God. That's all I could say. There are points when I knelt to pray, and um, what resulted was me hissing my teeth. But during that time, <coughs> there was one thing that I could say that brought me comfort, and that was Jesus. Just saying Jesus in whatever form, whether it was a silent scream, Jesus, or just saying Jesus. And that brought me comfort. I'm about to sing uh, some choruses reminding us of the power of Jesus' name. And if you feel like you would like to join in, please do so as we sing together. Kings and kingdoms will all pass 
good morning, First Church. Pastor, I think she'd be up for some international travel. You know, she could lead in all of your sermons. I think you all guys know him. This is uh, Pastor Jim Ayer. Uh, he's with Adventist World Radio. Uh, Pastor Ayer is an international speaker whose greatest passion is introducing people to a life-saving relationship with his best friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. His travels have taken him to more than 60 countries. and We thought 46 was a lot. He's authored a number of books, including his personal story, Second Chance, and his latest book, Transformation. In addition, he recently released a 12-week transformation study guide and a 12-episode TV DVD series called Remodeling Your Life, God's Transforming Power. He's written numerous magazine articles with special emphasis on revival. He serves as Vice President for Advancement at Adventist World Radio, based at the General Conference. He's also the producer and host of the popular television series, Making Waves, which airs on 18 Christian networks around the world. Amen. Help me to give a rousing national first welcome to Pastor Jim Ayers. Amen. Well, it is good to be with you today. And uh, am I on, I guess? Yes? yes. Okay. Um, bring you greetings from the General Conference, World Headquarters. Silver Spring, Maryland. I wasn't always in that area. I was uh, in a little place called Mount Shasta, California. Anybody ever heard of that? Hey, I see a few hands. All right, I'm amongst family. <laughs> you know, the base of a 14,000 foot volcano, incredible area. But God, God's done a lot of mighty things in my life. And uh, uh, one of the things that I've extremely enjoyed, I, I, Elder Wilson, uh, when he was elected, as General Conference President, he wanted a Revival and Reformation Committee at the General Conference. Not that, not that a committee can bring revival, but that it can set the, the stage in the church, hopefully for that atmosphere of revival and reformation. Some people get really freaked out, though, about reformation. Like one, one uh, fellow said the other day, a young pastor, he said, I don't know why people get so excited about that word because reformation is beautiful. Why is it beautiful? It's because it's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ. You know, I, I used to come home, and just to share with you, I would sometimes cry myself to sleep at night, crying over the same sins, the same old sins, over and over and over and over. I seemed like as a, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I had no power, no power whatsoever. And then God one day, in a mighty way, opened up some incredible things to me. And I began highlighting and marking my Bible. Every place that talks about the power of God, every place that speaks about God's desire to lift us up, God's desire for us to be overcomers, God's desire for us to, to be with him for all eternity. Why, when I got done, a big chunk of my Bible was highlighted in yellow. And then I thought, I'm going to see what Ellen White has to say. And I began building a PowerPoint presentation. And well, I finally got up to 100 slides, and I found that wasn't enough, and I started saying, well, this one looks better than this one. I'll take this one. I'll do this one. I did that for two years. Two years. Finally, I thought, she just got so much to say on the subject, there's no way I can possibly capture it all. Then I began building a, one, one presentation that was integrating the Bible topics in, in Ellen White, and soon God led me to some very exciting revelations about what he wants to do in our lives today, right now right now. And I, so I'm going to give you a little commercial. You'd expect being on radio and television, I give a little commercial, right? Well, I'm going to give you a quick commercial. One of those is, is uh, Second Chance, My Life Story. So I wasn't always a, a good-looking, handsome guy. I was a drug dealer, an alcoholic, and a thief. And uh, God did some incredible things because it's all about God's power. Amen. And then as they just mentioned, I wrote a new book called Transformation. Transformation. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. What mind is that? Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And so it's all about learning how to walk with Christ in an incredible way, because it's not about us. We can't do it. We can't do it, but Jesus Christ can. He's God. Amen. And when he lives in his life, God can do anything God wants to do. Amen? Amen. And then I decided... Well, I didn't decide. They asked me to write a, a study guide, so I did a 12-week study guide. It's called 
uh, your daily journey to transformation. It's five days a week for 12 weeks. And I can pretty much guarantee you, if you start out on this end, you get to this end, you're going to be a different person. And the person at this end is going to be a far better one than was on that end. Because it will lead you into that daily experience with Christ. And God wants to have a daily experience. I want to tell you, if you think that your your hand on the doorknob with reading one little uh, text in the morning and a cup of coffee in your other hand heading to work and saying, God bless me, it isn't going to work. It isn't going to work. And then I did a 12-episode television DVD series. All of these... Uh, Look at transformation from a different aspect. If you get one, you don't really have the other. It's not duplicating information. It's kind of like looking at the diamond of transformation from a different facet, each one. So I hope if you get an opportunity, maybe your church, if you've kind of wondered there's something you can do, you know, as a church family to pull you together, to press together, study guide might be it. Maybe consider that. And the deacons are going to give you a little... Reminder, okay, when you, when you go out the door, kind of what it is, where to get, of course, Review and Herald and Amazon and some of those places. But uh, I tell you, what I see in, in my travels and things is God is preparing to come very soon. The Lord is preparing to come soon. I w- I, some of you, huh, any, anybody here get Adventist World Radio uh, uh, information, kind of, or, or letters or anything? Anybody? A few of you here. So a few of you have probably heard some of these stories. And some of these stories also, uh, since I see a television camera and thing, I'm not going to be able to tell you what countries on some of them because it's just too dangerous to, to let folks know. There, there have been times past when the Review and Herald put in some, some article in the Review and it mentioned the name or something. All of a sudden, the leaders of that particular country connected that and connected that. And within a couple of months, those people were dead. So we're, we're playing, we're playing not, not, a, not a make-believe thing here. It's, it's for real and it's for keeps. The devil hates God's people. But let me tell you something. God's more powerful. God is more powerful. We're broadcasting into one country. And by the way, Adventist World Radio uses AM, FM, shortwave, the Internet, and now podcast. If you're not familiar with podcasts, we take all of our radio programs, repurpose them on the Internet so people can download them on their smartphones and listen. Uh, This is just a guesstimation because we just got some of the figures, but it looks like this past year, 1.7 billion downloads. Amazing stuff. We are now the largest provider of audio content for iTunes in the world. Hallelujah, right? I mean, it, it's time God's people quit being the tail and be the head. And, and God will enable us to do that as we follow along with him. Well, in this one particular country, we've been broadcasting by shortwave for a long time because shortwave gets into a lot of the, the places where the governments won't let us go. And now we'd heard that a lot of good things were happening, but we really didn't know. Finally, one day, we decided to try and sneak a couple of fellows up into this one area. Well, as they're sneaking along the jungle pathway. All of a sudden, the police came up to them. They caught them. Actually, they caught the one guy. They shot him and killed him. Another fellow narrowly escaped with his life. About three years later, we thought, well, let's see again. And one fellow said he's going to try and sneak up into that area. He got up into this one village. And I say village, but these places are huge, thousands of people. He got up there, and everybody was a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. He went to the chief. He said, how did this happen? Chief said, one day, a large man, an imposing figure of great stature with an aura of light about him came into our village. Now, anybody here in in Tennessee ever seen anybody with an aura of light about them? Well, the chief said, the guy came down, wanted to talk to the chief. I sat with him right here. He sat in this seat. He pulled a radio out of his clothes, tuned it to Adventist World Radio, said, listen to this. It'll bless you and your people. I took the radio from him, turned to the fellow next to me. We looked at it just for a moment. We turned back. He had vanished. Now, he said, we took this as a sign we should do as he said. Because, you see, these people are animus. They worship the rocks and the trees and the sky. They worship the creation, not the creator. Well, he said, we all fell in love with Jesus Christ. Now, this was really great, but our guy got to a second village. These villages are so far apart, they don't visit one another. They don't visit one another, but he found the same thing. Chief said, large man, imposing figure, great stature with an aura of light about him, came into our village carrying a radio. 
three, four, five, six villages. Later on, another half dozen villages. Later on, another dozen villages. Later, another dozen. And in that region now, because of the beans, whoever they are carrying radios, there's three to 400,000 Seventh-day Adventists in that area. Now, they're not on the church books, mind you, but they're certainly on the books of heaven. And that's the place to be, right? You realize, you realize you can be sitting here today with your name on the church books, but your name not on the heavenly books. That happened to me one time. That happened to me. I mean, I was, I, I, I was doing all these things. I was looking cool. I was in the church. I was paying tithe. I was doing all these things. I was going out and preaching. Brother, I was preaching, but without the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, one day sitting in church, the Lord said, Jim, the Holy Spirit may be poured out all around you, you're never going to recognize it or receive it. And praise God, he woke me up, gave me a second chance. You, know, you realize God is in the business of second chances. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now. Maybe you've left God altogether, but you're here today. God's calling you back and saying, hey, I love you. I love you. Come to me. Come to me. I'm go you're going to be with me forever. That's the kind of God we serve. Down in, down in uh, let's see, I was looking for a good book here. Down in Brazil, a young lady and her husband are driving on down the road, and kind of like happens once in a while, guys ride, the wife says, stop, stop, stop. Husband scares him half to death, whips over the side of the road, almost has an accident, and says, what? Says, honey, hang on. She jumps out of the car. She comes back, and she's got a book in her hands. She says, do you see any wind out there? No, no wind. Says, honey, this book was sitting there and the pages were blowing back and forth and back and forth. I just had to go see what, it, what this book was. Well, they read the book. They thought this was an amazing book. They had, to, they had to find out who wrote this book except there was no advertising in it whatsoever. One day, the young man's on his motorcycle in downtown, downtown Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he pulls up behind the bumper of this car and there on the bumper is an insignia the same insignia that was on that book he gets excited he pulls up alongside the car and he starts talking to the guy the guy's window is about halfway down well in Sao Paulo a guy on a motorcycle isn't necessarily the person you want to talk to he rolls up the window as soon as the light changes he takes off but the motorcycle whips in right behind him he's going to follow him they go on down they get to the next stoplight now the young man is desperate he pulls up alongside the guy he starts yelling this really freaks the driver out. The driver runs the red light off through the, off through the traffic. The fellow follows him on the motorcycle. Off downtown he's going. He kind of comes up to another light, and now the guy's trapped in a bunch of traffic. The young man comes up to him again right alongside and yells, great controversy, great controversy. This guy is a local Seventh-day Adventist church elder. He rolls down his window just a little. Said, what did you say? The book, great controversy. You have the insignia on the back of your bumper. That elder studied with those two young people, and they were baptized this last year. Amen. All because of a windless day with a book, the pages blowing back and forth. I want to ask you today, how big is your God? How big is your God? Really? I mean, when you think about it, a lot of times we give the devil more credit for having more power. We give the devil for having more, more power in our lives. Oh, God, I can't overcome this temptation. That's saying more about God than it is saying about you. Because our God has the power. He's, he's full of mighty power. Let me, let me tell you this amazing story. Talking to our uh, producer in a, eh, I can't tell you exactly, but a, a producer in an area where, where people are killing Christians. They're killing Christians left and right. And our pastor gets a phone call from this one fellow. Would you please come visit us? And it was in this particular city. So he goes to that city. He knocks on the door. Guy comes to the door, invites him in. As he's walking down the hallway, the fellow says, I'm the leader of a large organization here. Now, the uh, pastor figures, I'm a dead man. He brought me here to kill me. He comes around the corner, and there are 30 bearded men sitting in the living room. Now he knows for sure I'm a dead man. And while he's contemplating this, the fellow says, we brought you here today because we want you to secretly baptize all of us. Well, as the pastor now, he kind of sucks it up. And he's being pastoral. He said, well, I need to study with all of you. No, no. 
No, no, the fellow said, God has sent his angel to study with me in person every single day. And I've shared with these men, and we know the Bible very well. Pastor studied with them just that day. They knew everything, and he baptized them. How big is your God? You know, I tell you, we see so many things happening. God is appearing to these people in dreams and visions. He's sending angels to touch the hearts of these people. He is preparing for his soon coming. Question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Here in the United States, you know, sometimes people say, oh, nothing happens in the United States. Well, it, it does happen less, I'll, I'll admit. And, and let, me, let me tell you something. I give a little example. Uh, Peter's walking up the temple steps, right? He gets up there, and here's this fellow crippled there, and he's, he's begging, and Peter comes up to him and thinks, oh, goody, I'm going to get an offer. Offering, right? But Peter pulls out his pocket, and he says, let's see. I don't have any gold, and I don't have any silver, but what I've got to give to you, rise and walk. Amen. Now, what did Peter have? Holy Spirit. What didn't Peter have? Amen. Gold and silver, right? In the United States, what do we have? Gold and silver. What don't we have a lot of times? Holy Spirit. We need to be getting our lives together with God, begging for the Holy Spirit, for the power of the Spirit. Unless you have the fire of God in your life, some of our churches so cold you could skate down the center aisle. It's time we get the fire of God in our life. And he, he is ready, willing, and able to give it to you. Now let me share one story. Well, it, it happened to someone from the United States, but it didn't happen in the United States. But we're getting closer, okay? Uh, I don't know if you know Jamie Spence. Jamie Spence, Canvas Back Missions. This was at a time when Jamie, he had, he had his catamaran, and he was out sailing the islands in Micronesia, and he's trying to find this one island. Now, it was at a time when you didn't have GPS, so he had a sextant, and he wasn't very good at, he, he said, I wasn't very good at following the stars with a sextant. And he's looking for this island, and he's sailing, and he's sailing, and he's sailing. Finally, he said, God, you got to help me here. I can't find this island. Whack, 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 whack. And a bird hits him on the head and flies off. <laughs> well, that was, that was kind of interesting, but he, he keeps on sailing, and he's saying, God, please help me. And he's trying to figure out the stars. Whack, 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 whack. Vroom, bird flies off. <laughs> kind of like us, maybe. You know, sometimes it takes a lot for God to get through. And he, he says, Lord, if that was you, send that bird back. Whack, 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 and that bird flies off, and that bird was going in the opposite direction that he was sailing. He whipped that boat around, and he started following the way that bird went, and in a half an hour, he got to the island he needed to get to. God is ready, willing, able to guide you if you watch and listen and talk to him. Little Madagascar rice farmer. Uh, well, actually, yeah, he... He was a rice farmer, and he was little. He was about that tall, so I'll call him the little Madagascar rice farmer, I guess, fits. But uh, this fellow one day heard our program, and the program was on the Sabbath, and he ran and got his Bible. He had a Bible. You see, he was, he was a member of a little Catholic church. And he looked at it, he read it, he studied it, said, it's the truth. We've got to follow this. He went to his church. He said, folks, look it, look it. You... We've got to follow this. It's the seventh-day Sabbath, and it's never been changed. We've got to follow it. And he pushed it, and he pushed it, and he pushed it until the membership kicked him out. Now, he was the leader of that church. They kicked him out. I said, well, what did you do then? He said, well, I wasn't going to be deterred. It was Bible truth. He said, I went down the mountain. I found the people who were preaching this message. Adventist World Radio, praise God. And he said, I found them. I studied with them, and I was baptized. And I came back up the mountain. I said, what'd you do then? He said, I built a church. I said, you did what? He said, I built a church. I said, and he pointed, there across the fields uh, in the hill was this beautiful church. He said, I built it with my own hands, my own time, my own money. I said, did you have anybody coming to church? No. He said, you had nobody? No, not a soul. I said, but I, he said, I knew they would come. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds kind of like a movie, huh? said, I knew they would come. I said, do you have anybody now? He said, oh, yes, I have 30 people now that come regularly. Amen. One of the things I've found in these countries, 
when these people hear God's truth the first time, they're, go, they're going down the road this way. And they hear that truth, wham, and they're going this way from then on. I mean immediately. It's just like Matthew. The, Matthew there in chapter, I think, 7, 7 or 8 of Matthew, he, Jesus calls Matthew and says immediately he left his taxes, left all his money, everything. There's no record that he filled all his pockets and took everything. No. He leaves. God is looking for a 100% commitment to him. You realize 99% commitment is not going to get you there? 99% commitment is 100% disobedience. In Vietnam, we've been broadcasting in Vietnam a long time, and for years, boy, it was, it was pretty closed. But they're, they're starting to open up a little bit now. But one, one fellow heard our program. He, he became a pastor and, and uh, started sharing with others. And our, our program producer lives in Southern California. And he produced a DVD and got it into Vietnam. And they wanted to distribute that in this one big city. But it totally illegal, had no permission to do it. But the pastor and the membership said, we want to do it. We just want to do it. We feel compelled. So they head to that city. Man, within no time, the police and everybody kick him out. He comes back, he calls up our producer in L.A. and said, you know, told him the whole story. And our producer said, you need to pray and fast. So they prayed and they fasted. They, they, they fasted on the weekends and they prayed all through the week for a month. At the end of the month, pastor's getting discouraged because it doesn't seem like anything's breaking loose. And then there's a real hard kind of frantic knock in the door. He opens the door and this guy standing there in front of him, he recognizes is not a good recognition because this guy is typically on television on the most wanted list. He's the head of all the criminal element from the very city they got kicked out of. And this guy's holding up a DVD. And the fellow says, I want to meet the man who produced this DVD. Pastor says, well, he's not here. You can't meet him. But who you need to meet is Jesus Christ. Amen. Guy says, well, okay. He came in. He spent two weeks with the pastor and he was baptized. Amen. At the end of that time, he says, we need to go into the city and we need to hold meetings for my people. Now, my people are all the leaders of the criminal element. That's who his people were. Pastor says, well, I don't know about that, you know. Got kicked out last time and everything. He said, no, 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 there's no problem. They won't do anything to us. They're, they're, too, they're too scared. Pastor finally, well, okay, you know, leading the Lord. He goes down there. They have these meetings, 80 of the top criminal guys in that whole monster city were baptized. Amen. Then they said, we need, to, we need to hold citywide meetings. And get, get the, you know, police never did a thing. Uh -huh. And then they held citywide meetings, they baptized another 200 people. Amen. How big is your God? Amen. How big is your God? You know? And notice what the connection was here, prayer and fasting. God opened up the way. God opened up the way. A lot of times we read our Bible and we say, ah, you know, yeah, that, that was then. That was then. You look at the book of Acts. Yeah, that was then. But I don't see anything happening around me now. In one of these countries, this young lady heard our program totally illegal to, to share the gospel. But she says, you know, I've just got to share Jesus. You want to know if you've got Jesus in your heart when you just have to share it with somebody regardless of the consequences. Well, she just started sharing Jesus with everybody. Pretty soon, the police caught up to her. The police tied her hands behind her back, blindfolded her, and beat her up, and hauled her out in the jungle, dumped her off in the middle of the night, and said, let's see how big your God is. See if he can protect you. We're not going to kill you. We're going to let the animals do it for us. Well, that young lady was laying there. She's praying, God, please help me. You know, she could hear the growls and the snarls of the jungle animals. And... Uh, Scary thing. You know, when I was in Tanzania one night and in a little, little bungalow, and I thought, I'm going to go outside, you know, and listen to, the, listen to nature. And I open the door, and I get outside, and I hear this, Arr! Arr! Man, I came back in, closed the door. I thought, I don't need to see any or hear any nature. But that's what this young lady could hear, and she was scared to death. But then as she's praying, she said, Lord, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die if that's what you want. But I would love to tell more people about you, Lord. Love to tell more people about you. And pretty soon she wiggled and 
Well, her blindfold is off, but she's still laying on the ground, and she looks up, and she can't see where she is, and she keeps praying. And then all of a sudden, funny happens to her hands. And, wow, her hands are loose. And she stands up, and she looks and says, I, Lord, I don't know where I am. I need your help. It's totally dark. I can't see anything. And the wind begins to blow in the trees, rustle in the trees. The wind begins to blow harder, and pretty soon her hair is whipping back, and the wind's blowing harder and harder, kind of like, what was it, uh, just the other day here, you know, when I, when I got in, man, it's whipping and rolling. And, but this young lady, her stomach's feeling funny now. And, and the wind's blowing harder and harder and harder. Her hair is just whipping straight back. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, she's set down in her village completely free. Amen. Her own village completely free. Just like the book of Acts. Just like the book of Acts. How big? How big is your God? Is there anything too hard for God? What time do I have to quit? Ten after. <laughs> uh, a, a, a Muslim invited a local church elder to speak at his mosque. And apparently with the idea of converting the, the Muslim. But before, before he could speak, God appeared to the Muslim and said, do not try and convert this man. He's my man. He has a message for you and your people. Wow, as if this wasn't enough, God appeared to him two more times with the same, with the same directive. Do not try and convert him. Amen. Listen to him. He has a message for you. Well, it ended up, this, this imam invited this local church elder back five times to speak at his mosque. Amen. At the end of the fifth time, he got on the Internet. He began typing out a message. We need to be listening to Seventh-day Adventists. They have a message from God for us at this time. Amen. You know how big his Internet audience is? 200,000 people. 200,000 people. I could share other stories of how God is reaching into the hearts and lives of these people in a mighty, mighty way. Yes, Calling them to his side. God loves everybody. He's not willing that any, any, underline any, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loves each one of us in a Amen. mighty, mighty way. I'll tell you, in the United States, Heard this from, from a, a real sweet fellow not too long ago. He was, he was in the Coast Guard, and he was stationed in, uh, in Iceland. And uh, his tour of duty was up, and he wanted to get home back to the States just really bad. And so he thought, I know this guy who flying a plane tomorrow morning. If I can get on that plane, man, I'm out of here. I don't want to have to take the boat. It takes days to get out. So he went up to this guy's house, got to the door, and he started to knock. And he started to knock, and he started to knock, but his hand would not hit the door. He's a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and he keeps swinging for a second longer. His hand will not contact the door. And he said, there's something different here. <laughs> and he went home, and he got on his knees. He got on his knees, and he opened his Bible. He says, God, I need help. Now, he never... He never typically opened his Bible like this, he said, or, or did any of these things, but he opened his Bible and it fell to Isaiah chapter 52. And his eyes looked down and he had a King James Version. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. <laughs> okay, God. Okay. So he didn't go back to the guy's house. The next morning, the captain of one of the, one of the uh, ships said, hey, uh, we're heading to the mainland. You want to come with us? Yeah, I'll go with you. So he uh, hopped on that boat, and on the way out of the harbor, there goes that plane that he was going to be on. And days later, when they got to Maine, they found that that plane and all 12 men aboard had crashed, killed everyone on board. God knows the names of his people. God will watch over his people. God loves his people. And he has got such an interesting way of dealing with things in life to call us to his side. Max, I want to share with Max. Max is Papua New Guinea. Now, Max is the kind of guy was that, that if you saw him walking down the street over there, you'd hurry up and you'd move over here. You didn't want to be anywhere near Max. Well, one day the police caught up to Max and threw him in prison. Threw him in prison. There while he's in prison, Max notices an interesting thing because the people 
that are going to church on Sunday, they don't have to work on Sunday. Ah, no work, cool. He started going to church on Sunday. But then he noticed another thing because there was another group of people who went to church on Saturday and they didn't have to work on Saturday. Well, so now Mac goes to church two days a week. <laughs> Only there's a problem. He doesn't go long enough to let anything stick because, you see, he, break, he and two guys break out about three weeks after they're in prison. And they head up into the mountains, and this is a real no-man's land. This is, a, this is a terrible area where hardly anybody goes except all the criminal element. And Mac says, you know, we're going to need... We're going to need some real good excuses of why we're up here and why we're out here if the police catch up to us again. So he said, you know, if we say we're Lutherans, everybody in the area is a Lutheran. That won't mean much. Police won't believe us. They thought a minute. Said, but, you know, if, we're say, if we say we're Seventh-day Adventists, everybody here hates Seventh-day Adventists. That's believable. So he said, okay, we're Seventh-day Adventists. And they built with their own hands and time. They built a little church right up there, and they hung a sign, Seventh-day Adventist, right on the church. And inside, they cut a little trap door, and they dug a tunnel all the way out down the mountain, down to the river, so it was a good escape route in case the police came, and it was a good place to keep his AK-47 and all of their other weapons. Well, now the first Sabbath, Max and his buddies are sitting there. There's three of them, remember? Max says, well, let's see, there's three of us, let's see. You do AY service, and you do Sabbath school, and I'll do church. <laughs> but now something wasn't right, so they go out, and they come back, and they'd stolen three ties and three Bibles so they could do church right. <laughs> so now, while they're, while they're doing church after a couple of weeks or a few weeks of this, down in the valley, there's a big Lutheran church school. And since it's the only school around, there's a lot of Seventh-day Adventist young people that are going to the school too. And they hear about a brand new church up in the mountains. <laughs> and these young people say, next Sabbath, let's go to church up there. All of them say, yeah, good idea. They head up the mountain. And they get up there Sabbath morning, but the door's locked. And Max kind of startles Max. He figures it's the cops, and he goes, peeks out the window, but here's a whole bunch of young people. He opens the door. What do you want? We've come to have church with you. Oh. Well, come on in. And then he's thinking, what do we do now? We don't know how to do church. Well, let's say, you're, you're the visitors. Why don't you have church today? The young people say, okay. So Max and his buddies sit back, and they kind of like that. They kind of enjoy it. And uh, it's going on. And, and the next week, they come back, and they do the same thing in the next week. And then Max is sitting around waiting for his congregation to show up. But nobody shows up. Hmm. And a runner comes up from the valley. And, you know, at the criminal element, they, everybody knows everything, and they all tell Max. And they runs up and said, Max, the principal of that school found out these young people are coming up here, and he padlocked the school gate so they can't come out. Oh, Max got so mad. He goes over, he opens his trap door, gets his AK-47. He's walking down. Brr, brr, he's blowing off clumps of bananas. And then he stops. He turns back. He takes off his stolen tie, places it beside his stolen Bible because he figures it's not right to shoot somebody with a tie on. <laughs> he goes back down the mountain. He's going, coming down there, and he gets up to that gate, big old padlock on it. Brrr, he blows it off, and then he starts yelling, where are you? Where are you? He's looking for that principal. And where do you think that principal is, man? You know, he's down here. He, he's scared to death, hiding, hiding behind his desk. And Max comes up, shoves the gun in his chest, and he says, where's my congregation? <laughs> and I don't know where he came up with this, but he says, I don't know if you believe in hell, but if you don't give me my congregation, I'm going to send you there, and I'm going to meet you there shortly afterwards. <laughs> well, needless to say that the principal released the congregation. <laughs> and after, after a while, the young people said, Max can we have an evangelistic meeting? Max said, sure. What's an evangelistic meeting? (laughs) And they explained to him. He said, yeah, that's fine. So one of the young people called up the mission president way down the mountain. Mission president says, no way, man. That is too dangerous. I'm not coming up there. Young people say, no, no. Max said he and his buddies will do guard duty. It'll it'll be okay. (laughs) Mission president finally came up conducted the meetings, and toward the end of the meetings, he was baptizing people every night. 
And on the final night, Max and his two buddies were baptized. Amen. Now, they asked Max, said, Max, why, why did you wait so long to be baptized? <laughs> and Max says, you know, he said, I didn't think it'd be right if I was already baptized and I was protecting the meetings and I had to shoot somebody. <laughs> you know, God is so good. God is so wonderful. Now, that mission president became union president. I, I uh, corresponded with him recently, and it's Max and his two buddies. They're responsible for two churches now and 10, count them, 10 branch Sabbath schools. How big is your God? You know, how big is your God? We've got a little time left here. Hopefully, I want to share about Reuben. Reuben was a Seventh-day Adventist. He grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist, and when he got old enough in the home, he, he was in Kenya, he just couldn't stand it any longer. He left the home, left the religion, left everything. And he said, you know, I became a truck driver. And as truck drivers do, he said, all the stuff I got into. He said, I used to drive loads from the east side of Kenya out to the west side of Kenya. And uh, or, or the other way around, west side to the east side. And that meant going through Savo National Park. If you Google that, don't do it now. It's T-S-A-V-O, and if you put in man-eating lions, it'll immediately pop up, the man-eating lions of Savo. He said, for those right reason, he said, we never wanted to go through there at night, never took a load through there at night. But one day, the company called up and said, uh, Reuben, we've got a big load. We'll pay you extra money because it's got to get there right away, and that meant going through there at night. Oh, man, going through there at night. Talked with his, talked with his partner, and the partner says, yeah, uh, let's do it. We need the money. So they're going down the road, everything's cool, and they're going and putt, 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 and all of a sudden, <laughs> truck quits right in the middle of Savo. Rolls up the window, calls the company. Company said, it'll be morning before we can get you any help. Morning. Wow, okay. Turns on the radio, and on the radio, there's a preacher who said, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. They reach over, turn it off. Don't want to hear that. About this time, on Reuben's side, which is the opposite side of our cars, here's a male lion right up in the, in the window. Now, a male lion, 450, 500 pounds, he fills the whole windshield, and he's nose to nose with Reuben. Make you a little nervous. Now, that lion gets down. He goes out. He wanders out of ways. He meets a female and a couple of, couple of cubs out there, and he mills around for a bit, and then he comes back, and he puts his paws up on the windshield. Now, this is a mid-engine truck, so there's, just, there's no hood just flat with windshield, and he looks in at Reuben's partner, and he looks in at Reuben, and he backs up, backs up, backs up, and mills around for a second. All of a sudden, he takes off. He flies through the air, smashes through the window, and grabs Reuben's partner right out of the truck, and Reuben's partner is screaming and hollering, and the lion begins to eat him from the feet up. And for Reuben, that was a come-to-Jesus moment. Reuben is saying, God, save me. I'll do anything you want, Lord. Just save me. Help me. He can't do anything for the partner. And this continues on for some time. And Reuben's saying, please help me, help me. And finally, it's all over. And the lion comes back up and puts his paws on the windowless vehicle now and stares in at Reuben. And he backs up again. And about that time, there's a car over here that drives up with the lights on and just stops. Reuben says, I figured they were just too scared to do anything. And the lion comes back again and looks at Reuben, backs up again takes off, flies through the air, paws, slam on the, the dash of the truck, flips up on the top of the vehicle where he goes to sleep all night long. All night long. Next morning, the guys come, chase him off, and there's a little tiny lady gets out of that truck. She walks up to Reuben, who is about six foot three, pokes her finger in his chest and said, are you a Christian? He says, well, I, 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 I guess I am. And then she doesn't know him. He doesn't know her. Well, yeah, at least he doesn't know her. Pokes fingers in her chest again and said, you need to go home and study and pray. And she got in her car and she left. Said, Reuben, who do you think that was? Well, he says, I kind of think it was my angel. And I said, yeah, I, I would agree with you. Amen. I would agree with you. Now, Reuben was good to, to his word to God. He became a, a literature evangelist. and He's distributing literature all over Kenya. Matter of fact, we chipped in together our crew and we bought him a motorcycle so he could get around and do things better. But the Bible, and I heard, I heard one of your folks from up here say it this morning, the devil is as a roaring lion going around seeking whom he may devour. 
He want, make no mistake, he wants to devour you. The devil hates anything that is godly. The devil hates the creation of God, and you happen to be God's creation. And he hates you, and he wants to destroy you. Ragasa, I met Ragasa down at Madagascar. Ragasa grew up in a family where, just like we're talking right now and looking at one another, she communed with demons in the family. Now, this is, this is very normal for, for many of these countries. The demons, the demons are in the homes. And as she's talking with the demons one day, the demon said, you're old enough now. We'd like to make you a witch. We'll give you great power if you would like. Great power. Sounded pretty good to her. Demon said, go down to the river where we'll meet you. She went down to the river where she went underwater for a day and a half. I stopped the interview right there. I thought I heard something wrong with the interpreter. I said, how long did you say? She says, one and a half days I was underwater. The demons gave me power over lightning. I could control lightning. I could be shot with a gun. It wouldn't hurt me. One day the armies of the country came to take over our village. It was in all the newspapers. I created potions that kept the whole army away. Understand this. The devil was the fourth most powerful being in all the universe next to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Fourth most powerful being. If we think that... We can handle the devil on our own. We are greatly mistaken. Amen. We cannot, we will not. If you set your feet out of the bed in the morning without committing to God, you've committed to the devil and he will tear you apart. Amen. He will tear you apart. But you know, praise God. Read my Bible from cover to cover and God always wins. Amen. God is more powerful. You cannot find a situation where God ever loses. Amen. And that power is ready and willing and able to help you in your situations for the asking. Amen. And Ragasa, she, she messed up, did something that made the demons mad, and she was sick, and she went to the doctor. She, she tried to get healing. It, it didn't do any good. One day she came across two young ladies dressed very nicely, she said, in white apparel. And these young ladies said, we understand that you have a real problem. We represent the God of heaven, and he can heal you. Huh. She said, we'd like to pray for you. She said, well, the demons haven't done anything for me lately. Go ahead. And they prayed for her, and she was instantly healed. And then they gave her a radio and said, listen to this. They tuned it to AWR and said, it'll bless you greatly. Amen. And she began listening to Jesus Christ, and she fell in love with Jesus. And then she said, I was baptized. And I stopped, and I asked her, I said, did the devil try and drown you in, in the waters? because I've seen this happen in many places. No, no, she said, because people prayed and fasted for me for seven days. There's power in, the, in prayer. There's power in God. It says, I came up out of the water. My house, it was right next to the river, burnt to the ground. The devil was so mad, he burnt my house to the ground. It says, as soon as the ashes cooled, I went kicking through the ashes, looking, she says, for my Bible. And she said, there it was. I found it. It had not a scratch on it. It didn't even smell like smoke. And she said, because of that, many people in my village believed. And then she stopped and said, can you help me? I said, help you do what? Oh, she says, she says, help me build a church. I said, why? She says, because I have 100 people coming now that accepted Jesus Christ. Our God, brothers and sisters, is more powerful. Our God is a mighty God. And I want to ask you this morning, have you invited that God into your life 100% surrendered all to him so that power might change and transform your life? See, God in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 is looking for overcomers. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Can you imagine? I look at that and say, God, I spit in your face so many times. So many times, and you want me to be a co-regent with you in the universe? And God said, yes, I do, because I love you. Because Jesus died for you and has put his righteousness around you, and now I want to fill you with the Holy Spirit. You realize God just doesn't want us clean on the outside. He wants you clean on the inside, too. It's all about God, though. It's God doing both, but he's looking for your permission. So I ask you this morning... For those, will you give God permission to transform your life? Can I see your hands this morning? Amen. Amen. Let's have a prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for being the God of power. I thank you so much for being the God of love. Lord, you're so incredible. And we want to thank you today. You've seen all the upraised hands today, Father. I pray for each person who raised their hands. If there's anyone here who didn't, Father, speak to them too and put your arms around them and draw them near to you. 
Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, and one day soon we can look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for you, and you will save us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.